Tunisia's president reaches out to migrants months after launching a crackdown on them. Kai Saied is hoping to clinch a $1 billion EU bailout and in return stem the rising migration to Europe. Are migrants being used as political pawns? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohamed Jamjoum. A record number of people are making the dangerous journey by boat from Tunisia across the Mediterranean to Europe. Many of them are from poor and conflict-hit countries in sub-Saharan Africa. But an increasing number of Tunisians trying to escape hunger and unemployment are joining them. That's got countries in Europe alarmed. As part of efforts to stem the flow, they're offering an aid package of more than $1 billion to help stabilize Tunisia's economy. Rights groups are criticizing the proposal, saying it compromises the rights of refugees and asylum seekers. There's lots to discuss with our guests, but first, Om Sum Sharif sets the scene for us. A financial deal that Tunisia is in desperate need of as it struggles with multiple overlapping crises. But at the heart of a major aid package are refugees and migrants. The European Union is concerned that if Tunisia's economic crisis deepens, more migrants will arrive on Europe's shores. We both have a vast interest in breaking the cynical business model of smugglers and traffickers. It is horrible to see how they deliberately risk human lives for profit. So we will work together on an anti-smuggling operational partnership and we will support Tunisia with border management. The financial offer follows talks in Tunis with leaders of European Commission, Italy and the Netherlands. <laughs> Speaking in Sparks ahead of the meeting, President Kais Said said any solution to the Mediterranean migrant crisis should not come at the expense of his country. <laughs> They are victims, victims of a global system that unfortunately treats them not as human beings, but as numbers. We cannot play the role that some play openly and others hide, being guards for their countries. That's in sharp contrast to his comments in February when he accused migrants of bringing violence and crime to Tunisia and urged security forces to take action. The president also said people arriving from sub-Saharan Africa posed a threat to the country's demographic makeup. It prompted anti-hate speech demonstrations from rights groups and racially motivated attacks. Hundreds of people were detained. Many questioned the president's apparent U-turn ahead of a possible bailout. This treaty will have bad consequences if it will be coupled with other bilateral agreements between the EU and the transit countries on the Mediterranean, which due to their suffering economies tend to turn into gathering points for illegal migrants. A major push for the financial deal comes from Italy, the destination for most people departing from North Africa. Tunisia is less than 150 kilometers from the island of Lampedusa. More than 36,000 migrants, including several Tunisians, arrived in Italy in the first four months of the year. In April, Coast Guards and Sfax retrieved more than 200 bodies in a matter of days. While many refugees come from African countries, the worsening economic crisis is forcing more and more Tunisians to risk the crossing in the hopes of reaching safer shores. Amikulsum Sharif, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. All right, for more on all this, I'm joined by our guests. In Brussels is Julian Hoez, a European Union affairs analyst. In Tunis is Tariq Kahlawi, columnist and former director of the Tunisian Institute of Strategic Studies. And also in Brussels is Yasmin Akrimi, a North Africa research analyst at the Brussels International Center. Yasmin focuses on Tunisian politics and transitional movements in the Maghrib. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Tariq, let me start with you today. Uh, President Qais Saied is hoping to get this $1 billion EU bailout for the struggling economy in Tunisia. The EU wants to stem the flow of migrants to Europe. So isn't what we're seeing here, at its essence, 
migrants basically being used as pawns? Well, yes and no. No, actually, yes. Uh, it's like you know, in international relations, the the don't don't know equation is happening here. I mean, Kais Saeed is no doubt using the immigration card uh, as part of uh, a whole bargain uh, with regards to microfinancial assistance to Tunisia. Tunisia is in need of uh, a lot of financial assistance. The budget deficit is really increasing. So uh, the president knows very well that uh, he needs financial assistance. The IMF um, uh, agreement has been paused because he's not uh, in agreement with some of the uh, reforms that are proposed in the staff level agreement of October 15th last year. Um, so he's trying to renegotiate the IMF financial assistance. And with that, he wants to have more bilateral financing. Um, and yes, he used uh, the um, immigration card. But at the same time, also the European Union is doing the same. Uh, the European Union is trying for years now to pressure North African countries, including Tunisia, to have a different deal with regards to immigration. Uh, we're not exactly uh, sure of the details of this um, new deal. We're still waiting for the memorandum to be signed and possibly published by the end of this month. Uh, but we already know that the European meeting that happened about 24 hours before mm. the visit of European leaders to Tunisia uh, was basically pushing for a more speedy process when it comes to immigration mm. and for a third safe country to be part of the equation, and that might be Tunisia. So we're going to have to wait for the deal to be uh, seen in details, but certainly what's happening here is don't know, don't know from both sides, not only from mm. high side sides. Tarek, I, I want to get back to um, the IMF uh, proposal uh, shortly with you. But before that, I, I, I just want to talk more about the migrants uh, and the stance towards them when it comes to the Tunisian government. Because uh, the president, uh, President Saeed, went to Sfax ahead of this meeting with EU officials. Um, he said that any solution to the Mediterranean migrant crisis should not come at the expense of his country. Um, and he, he basically used a lot of uh, humanitarian caring language when it came to the plight of the migrants. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is quite a contrast to what we heard from Qais Saeed a few months back. Uh, this was in February when he accused migrants of bringing violence and crime to Tunisia. Uh, he also said that people arrive from sub-Saharan Africa posed a threat to his country's demographic makeup. So the fact that we've seen such a shift in tone from the president at a time when the president uh, is making this agreement with the EU, doesn't that also contribute to a cynical attitude toward all this and, again, to the idea that uh, migrants are being used as political pawns? Well, actually, the fact is that his, it's not the first time he uses this human, humanly caring language. He uh, kept saying that for months now. Actually, the um, statement, the presidential statement uh, that was referring basically to the great replacement theory, that statement was unusual. That's not the frequent language that Kai Saeed would use. His frequent language was just like he did in the Sfax visit just a day before the European leaders' visit to Tunisia, was what he uses to, to say for, for so many months all along. But the problem with that, it's not the different tones between that presidential statement that happened in February or early March, actually, and uh, the, the, his humanely caring language. It's between discourse and practice. There is no doubt in my mind that uh, Saeed is uh, partly uh, politically canny. He's, uh, is, uh, he uses discourse sometimes to uh, seal or uh, hide away some of the practices. We're going to have to wait for the memorandum, but it's possible that uh, even though he kept saying that Tunisia is not a coast guard for the European Union, he might agree on some measures that would actually be characterized as if Tunisia is behaving mm. like a coast guard. Uh, Yasmin, I, I saw you reacting. It looks like you want to jump in. Let me just ask you first. Of course, those who are opposed to this plan uh, say that the economic help that's being offered to Tunisia is simply uh, some form of blackmail in order to get Tunisia to do Europe's dirty work when it comes to controlling borders and helping with illegal deportations. What do you say? What do you think about that? I mean, if you, if you see how Europe has been uh, dealing with its so-called southern neighbors, and, you know, for, for neighbors to be neighbors, you have to have uh, um, a balanced relationship. If you see 
how Europe has been dealing with, with migration and the whole anti-immigrant sentiment in Europe that has been at the basis of so many, and still is at the basis of so many uh, political campaigns here in Europe. And so, so much like uh, uh, for the rise of the, of the far right in Europe, uh, uh, you cannot help but think that this is, again, another attempt by Europe to externalize its frontiers in Tunisia, and it has been doing that for, for many, many years now. Now, the, I think what is specific about um, what's happening at the moment is that Italy, uh, which has a far-right leadership, has really been championing uh, the idea that Tunisia should receive the IMF fund. And again, um, uh, everything that has been promised to Tunisia in the last visit uh, by Ursula von der Leyen and the Dutch prime minister and the uh, Italian prime minister, every all, all financial aid is conditioned by um, Tunisia receiving the IMF fund. So again, this is all conditioned on Tunisia implementing austerity measures, very harsh austerity measures. Um, Italy has really been pushing for Tunisia to, to, to get that fund and has really been pressuring both the EU and other uh, individual European countries to uh, financially um, help Tunisia, because the only um, uh, thing that Italy cares about is to superficially stabilize enough Tunisia and, and North Africa for, um, for these countries, for North African countries, mm. to effectively um, uh, uh, implement uh, um, EU's externalization border policies mm. and to effectively, again, come back to the idea of uh, guarding the borders of Europe. So I have no doubt that this is... Um, I'm not sure if it's blackmailing, because I think it, it, there, there's political capital in using migrants on the part of, of, of Qais Saeed also, but mm. this is definitely a, a, a migration deal. Uh, Julian, um, you heard uh, Yasmin there talk about Italy's role in all this. Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney has pushed the IMF to relax its conditions uh, when it comes to the bailout proposal for Tunisia. Uh, do you think that's going to happen? I mean, honestly, like many things in politics, we never know if something's actually going to happen until it actually happens. But I just want to add to the points that were made by my fellow panelists here about exactly what's going on behind this in general. So, one, there is the fact that uh, Giorgia Maloney does want to have an artificial stabilization of the Tunisian economy because the fear is that any further destabilization could lead to social unrest that would lead to the migrant path being blown completely open. And as we know, the far right in Europe is very much uh, banking on something like this to uh, have a benefit and win elections. And it's always been one of their main priorities. However, there's two reasons why the EU would want this deal that haven't necessarily been discussed yet. One of these is of course, Tunisia is one of our closest neighbors and is a part of the neighborhood. And the EU benefits from having a stable neighborhood where, economically, the EU can have stronger relationships with certain countries. But on top of this, there is also a short geopolitical uh, aspect to this, where the EU has also been fighting for years now to combat influence of states such as Russia and China that have been preying on states like Tunisia that have been trying to take advantage of the instability and that are trying to turn these into a game of geopolitical chess that's not unlike what we witnessed in the, during the Cold War. And the uh, EU would also like to make sure that it's actually supporting its allies in the region. Uh, Julian, uh, let me follow up with you. Uh, look, there's a lot of components to all of this. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, do you believe that Tunisia is going to need to finalize its IMF program in order to actually qualify for the aid proposal with the EU or the aid agreement with the EU? Honestly, the EU uh, deal was basically constructed not to help Tunisia to actually meet the reform agenda that the IMF requested. So in order to help finance several initiatives, well, the majority of the initiatives even. But of course, the EU understands that the Tunisian president may actually just outright refuse to engage in this because he feels like it may weaken him at home, it may weaken his position with his supporters, and it could lead him to feeling like he can be easily blackmailed. So what would ideally need to be done is that the EU will need to find a way to actually smooth this over, potentially through the efforts of Georgia Maloney and other leaders, in order to actually encourage the president to actually engage in accepting this deal. However, again, like many things in politics, we never know if something's actually going to happen at the end. 
until it actually happens. And I think that right now the situation is quite tense purely because of all the speculation, all of the claims about who feels what and who is being taken advantage of, who is being scapegoated for the mm. monetization of migrants, as many have said. Uh, Tarek, so uh, Tunisia had agreed to a loan from the IMF, but then President Saeed subsequently rejected uh, the conditions that were set by the IMF, or at least some of those conditions. I, I want to ask you why. Why, when Tunisia is facing such dire financial straits, you have foreign investors that are pulling out of Tunisia, ratings agencies are on alert, inflation and joblessness are on the rise. Tunisians, by and large, are struggling to make ends meet. So why reject these conditions? Well, I think there are two main reasons for this. First of all, there is an ideological reason. Uh, Kais Saied is um, basically in alliance with the party of the administration, the technocrats of the state, um, since he took over in July 25. And uh, his government is in line with uh, what should be seen by uh, the IMF as reforms. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but his background is basically pan-Arabist, socialist kind, his for the social role of the state, things like that, that are in collusion with, uh, with the IMF usual reforms, package of reforms. But, you know, he let the government negotiate for months uh, to reach the staff level agreement in October 15, 2022. Only then he decided to um, come up and say, basically, that he's against some clauses of the agreement, especially the privatization of state-owned enterprises, but notably the gradual, uh, basically, ending of the subsidy system. Um, and I think the second main reason for this, because he sensed that maybe these reforms are going to hinder political stability and his uh, grab of power, uh, that it would actually threaten his uh, his rule. And I think this, this is uh, a more important reason for him. I don't think that he's going to agree to any of reforms like that, that he suspects that are going to basically threaten uh, political stability before mm. the elections of 2024, if they happen by the end of 2024. Um, so that's essential. Uh, mm. the, the, I have to say something about the IMF uh, deal. It's true that uh, um, uh, these reforms were negotiated by the Tunisian government and the IMF, but uh, since Kai Saeed said no to some of these elements, uh, there is a, a growing uh, acceptance by the IMF, but especially by the decision makers. Um, to a possible revision of the staff level agreement. And I think the European, specifically the Italian lobbying, uh, has reached a point to influence even the U.S. decision. Yesterday's mm. um, statements by Antony Blinken after the visit of the Italian foreign minister, Tajani, uh, and Blinken saying very clearly that they are, uh, there is a need for a revised proposal by the Tunisian government, it's a sign that they are ready to revise the staff mm. level agreement. We have to, to, to see what kind of revisions. Kai Said mentioned a possible new tax system to mm. tax the wealthy, uh, but we need more details. And I think the Tunisian government is going to send a revised proposal to the IMF. Uh, Yasmin, uh, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said that the EU would also expand opportunities for young Tunisians to study, to work, to train in the EU in order to help them develop skills that could be used to boost the Tunisian economy. But there was no mention made about facilitating visa applications for Tunisians to get to EU countries. What to make of that? Yeah, just uh, to you know, give you a, a very a quick state of affairs. In Tunisia, in Morocco, and in Algeria, it was already for years since the Schengen visa system uh, has been uh, implemented. It was already very hard to, it, it became increasingly very hard to get a visa. The list of documents is on and on. The cost is on and on. And the refusals uh, became very common. Now, in the last uh, few months, and even in the last couple of years, when France decided to basically decrease uh, uh, the percentage of, of visas that it will give to the three Maghreb countries that I just mentioned, so by 50% for Algeria and Morocco and by 30% for, um, for Tunisia, it's not even getting the visa that became the problem. It is getting an appointment. Today, um, if you scroll down any uh, uh, social media uh, platform uh, that has 
you know, Tunisians and Moroccans and Algerians in it, you'll see uh, hundreds of testimonies of young filmmakers not getting their visas, of um, uh, students with um, European um, scholarships not getting their visas people who need to get medical care in Europe not getting their visas. So we can talk a lot about improving regular pathways for, for migration, but the truth on the ground is that it is almost impossible now for a young person to get a touristic visa, and I'm not even talking about a work visa or a student or, or a studies visa. So um, the, the, the complaints about irregular migration increasing and in Tunisia it dramatically increased just to give you a quick number um, uh, a quick comparison between January 2020 and January 2022 in the number of boats leaving from Tunisian shores so Tunisians and non-Tunisians um, these multiplied by 10 in two years only two years so if you're if you're complaining as um, as a partner and as a block and as individual countries about irregular migration while you're actively uh, sabotaging any pathway for regular migrations for young microbees, this is very incoherent. So you can put it, you know, in an agreement that you're going to uh, uh, bolster these regular migration pathways. But the reality is it is increasingly hard for any North African to migrate regularly to Europe, educated and non-educated. Julian, you, you heard Yasmin there say that this is essentially incoherent. I mean, if the European Commission is saying that it will offer opportunities for young Tunisians to study and work and train in the EU, is it not incumbent upon the EU to then facilitate visa applications? Well, the problem with this is that a lot of it comes down to bilateral relationships between the member states and uh, the North African countries. I mean, for example, it wasn't until late last year where the tensions between France and Algeria, for example, over a series of diplomatic uh, conflicts had actually fought enough where the French state was willing to have a conversation about liberalizing visas and increasing the number of visas and appointments that were being given. I mean, the EU, the reason why they didn't say anything specifically about uh, visas is because they simply cannot just force member states to issue more visas. That is sadly not something that's going to happen, and this is something that the member states need to do. And I think this is part of the big balancing act when it comes to the EU and a lot of migration issues and a lot of, I mean, we can go as far as asylum issues, where a lot of it is entirely dependent on the member states having agreements and the member states accepting certain actions, which is why, for example, the meeting last week on the new migrant deal, which was declared historic by the Swedish minister involved, was a step towards trying to find a solution that would make things more coherent. But, of course, we do need to look at the systems in place and actually try to figure out what is happening and whether it's actually fair or it works correctly. Because, for example, think of mm. all the young Tunisians or the young Algerians who could contribute to our societies, but who or who need to be in our medical system for healthcare reasons, mm. who simply cannot because they've not got the opportunity. And this is something that, in some ways, we need to all look at the uh, core EU values and actually think about what is actually what we should be doing, you know, Julian, and what is the right thing to do. Julian, let me also ask you, you know, there, there's a lot of criticism from migrant advocacy groups uh, about the potential for forced repatriations, uh, potentially abuses of migrants uh, in, in Tunisia as well. Um, what guarantees are there that, that there would be a respect for human rights in all this? What guarantees are there? Well, this is the big question, honestly, and this is something that, again, we need to be looking at what's happening and actually try to find what works best. I mean, for example, one of the big reasons why they talk about safe countries in the uh, prelude to the agreement that re was released a few days ago is that the EU needs to have strong agreements with certain states that can be considered safe. And I'm not talking about things such as what the uh, UK have done with the Rwanda camps and all this kind of thing. But we need to actually find a way of finding states that are able to actually take these migrants and do it safely. And if not, have contingencies to say, OK, if you cannot return safely, we need to figure out a way of ensuring your safety ourselves. But again, this is something that we're not going to know until the full agreement is released mm. and until more work has been done. Because as has been said multiple times during this uh, discussion, a lot of this discussion is being driven by the far right. And the far right, once these migrants or these asylum seekers leave our shores, they stop caring. And oftentimes, they actually balk at the idea of having to spend extra money or put mm. in place more provisions to actually support these people when they get to spaces where they should be safe because they don't view it as a problem and they view it as a victory electorally, which is a, 
an increasingly big problem when it comes to European politics, especially ahead of the elections next year. Yes, I mean, I, I want to take a step back and look at the human dimension to all of this. Uh, and I want to preface this by saying that five years ago, I was on a reporting trip in Tunisia. I went to Zarziz. Uh, I went to the coastal city of Zarziz in the south, where at that time you had uh, hundreds of bodies that were washing up, people that had tried to leave Libya, uh, didn't make the journey across the sea, and their bodies would wash up in Zarzis, and you had volunteers that were digging graves for them so they could have some dignity in death. And the reason I bring all this up is because you now have a situation where more and more refugees and migrants are undertaking this perilous journey from Tunisia in unprecedented numbers. Uh, there are Tunisian authorities that say that they stopped 13,000 people from attempting the crossing from Sfax in the first three months of this year. No matter what agreements may be made, the fact of the matter is that desperate people will continue to try to undertake these journeys. Is that not the case? Yeah, this is something that is crucial to understand. Nothing in this world will prevent people from trying to get a better life. Nothing. What it will do is that it will make their journeys riskier and it will create more debts. And this is a, a trend we have been seeing for decades now. In Tunisia at the moment, for example, uh, you have daily trips by mm. fishermen who are trying to uh, fetch corpses, uh, corpses of people we don't even um, know and we cannot even identify. Today, mm. people who are dying at sea in Tunisia, non-Tunisian specifically, because the state does not have the political will nor the logistics to identify everyone, they are being buried in mass graves because we just do not have the capacity to, um, to, to identify these people. We don't have the capacities to tell their families that they die or they arrive safely or they are um, incarcerated in some European country. This is what it means to give money for mm. immigration to be, um, to be prevented at any cost. All right, well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Julian Hoez, Yasmin Akrimi, and Tarek Kahlawi. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here. Bye for now.